this amount of alcohol dangerous? It's a serious question. In 2023, the World Health Organization issued this guidance that said, no level of alcohol consumption is safe for our health. That's a pretty strong statement. Pretty strong statement. Then just last week, the US Surgeon General called for warning labels on drinks. Meanwhile, Australia has revised their drinking guidelines down. A sobering warning just in time for the silly season. Adults should have a maximum of 10 standard drinks a week. And Canada went even further. New recommended guidelines for Canadians advise no more than two drinks a week. Two drinks a week? Well, that's just not uh, feasible, not in this country. Seems like uh, there's different study out every couple of years. For a long time, there was this guidance out there that a little bit of alcohol could actually be helpful for your health. Yeah, I remember seeing that, especially about red wine. A glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. A daily beer or a wine with friends can actually be good. So what's going on? Why is there all this contradictory information? Is moderate drinking good or bad? Here at Howtown, we investigate where information comes from. And this week, we're gonna dive into decades of alcohol research to try and figure out just how dangerous this is. In 1991, 60 Minutes ran a segment that basically asked, why don't French people have more heart attacks if they eat so much cheese? The answer to the riddle, the explanation of the paradox may lie in this inviting glass. They're saying that if you're gonna eat cheese, you should be eating cheese with wine. That's right, wine and cheese is the perfect pairing. The evidence for this protective power of drinking came from a bunch of different studies. Here's one from 1981, where they looked at 8,000 people from the San Francisco Bay Area and divided them into groups based on the amount they reported drinking. Each group had the same number of women and men, black people and white people, people living in San Francisco versus Oakland, they had the same age distribution. The goal was to make the groups as similar as possible so any difference in health could be associated with their drinking habits. And then they watched and waited to see who got sick and who died. After 10 years, the six plus group saw the most deaths, followed by the three to five group. That's not at all surprising. There's no disagreement that binge drinking and heavy drinking are really bad for you. But the people who drank one to two drinks per day actually saw less death than the people who didn't drink at all. Diving deeper into the data, deaths from accidents, liver disease, and cancer were highest for heavy drinkers, and lowest not for non-drinkers, but for moderate drinkers. And when it came to heart problems, non-drinkers actually had the worst outcomes. There's a sweet spot where you're not having all the cancer and, and disease of a heavy drinker, but you're mm. getting the protection for, of your heart from being a moderate drinker. That was just one study, but the pattern was seen over and over and over. Combining the results from 34 of these studies in what's called a meta-analysis, you get this graph with this so-called J-curve. This is the number of drinks per day at the bottom plotted against the relative risk of death. So that would suggest that your best case for your health or your risk of not dying is, is, is not to abstain completely, but to drink a very little bit. Exactly. A, a little is better than none is sort of the, the takeaway. Wine consumption in the U.S. had been falling in the 80s, but then right around the time of all this coverage, the trend reversed. There has been for years the belief by doctors that alcohol reduces the risk of heart disease. Now it's been all but confirmed. It was just assumed to be so. It was a reality. It was a fact. Nobody questioned it. And if you did question it, you were pilloried. In the early 2000s, Tanya Sikritsis was one of the scientists pointing out some issues with the J-curve. Most of these observational studies misclassify people in terms of their exposure to alcohol. How do they define a non-drinker? That Bay Area study just asked people, in the past year, did you drink any alcohol? Some studies just ask about the past week or the past three days. And most people who go into those studies claiming that they are a non-drinker actually were drinkers back in their 20s and 30s. Nobody would publish a tobacco study where they called somebody who had a history of one pack a day for 25, 30 years and had given up in five years. They would never call that person non-smoker. But we do it with alcohol research all the time. And the reason why that's a problem is because ex-drinkers tend to be unhealthier. There's a big group of people who used to drink a lot, then their health started deteriorating, so they stopped. And even among the people who are actual lifetime abstainers, many of them may have avoided drinking because of health conditions they already had. Lumping all these people into the non-drinkers column has the potential to push up the death rate of that whole group. And that's just the first issue. Did you see this, this TikTok from Hank Green 
that was about Hank's razor. Mm -mm. If I die anytime soon, I want you to, I want one, just one favor. I want you to call it Green's razor, no, Hank's razor, for anything that can be explained by socioeconomic status, it's probably that, rather than the thing that you're measuring. I'm not gonna die anytime soon, I don't think. But if I do. <laughs> I'm hoping that he lives for a long time, but I also want to invoke Hank's razor uh, in this episode Love it. and apply it to these studies. The first question is, could your level of drinking be connected somehow to your wealth? Mm. And it turns out that it can be. Lower income was associated with higher odds of abstinence and of heavy drinking relative to light slash moderate drinking. Which means that in this moderate drinking group, there's probably a disproportionate amount of rich people. And there's lots of ways being rich can help your health. More time for exercise, access to better doctors, better medicine, better food, less exposure to pollution, etc. That Bay Area study noticed that moderate drinkers had higher educational attainment and may therefore tend to have a healthier lifestyle. And all that could pull down the death rate of the moderate drinking group. In other words, these studies might not be picking up the benefits of moderate drinking, but the benefits of being rich. So is this J-curve just a mirage? Scientists have tried to figure that out in a bunch of different ways, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about a service that helps you navigate a different kind of complexity. Today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is this website, an app, that gathers news headlines from 50,000 sources around the world and categorizes them based on their political bias, how factual the publication tends to be, and who owns them. So this could be a way to browse headlines um, and also get this additional metadata about where it's coming from. One of my favorite features is this blind spot feature where you can see what stories are being covered way more by one side or the other. This leak from the Department of Justice was much more heavily covered on the right, the rise of the super wealthy on the left. It seems like right now we're in our own silos of news, and so it's easy to sort of lose track of what other people are experiencing and how, how that's informing their worldview. So I think that's really a valuable thing. If you want to sign up for this service and get the Vantage plan that, that I use, you can go to ground.news slash Howtown and get 40% off. Now back to booze and interrogating that famous J-curve. In 2023, a research team took raw data from 107 papers that looked at drinking habits and mortality risk, and they saw that familiar pattern. But when they adjusted that data to try and account for lifestyle differences between groups and the way abstainers were defined, that benefit of moderate drinking shrank. It was no longer statistically significant. It's hard to say if these studies were picking up on some slight cardiovascular benefit or if confounding factors were still playing a role, or maybe both. You can never completely get rid of confounding in an observational study. It's just not possible. Here's another giant meta-analysis where they again tried to minimize the influence of confounding factors. And it's pretty amazing. They got data from 195 countries and a total study population of 28 million people. When they looked at heart disease, they still saw a bit of a J-curve, but the slight benefit to the heart from a daily drink was more than canceled out by an increased risk of cancer. Put it all together and the risk from disease looks like this. You don't see any net benefit from moderate drinking. And if you weigh that up, why on earth would you recommend somebody to drink for heart health? Makes no sense at all. Most of the science we've talked about so far comes from observational studies that look for associations between drinking habits and health outcomes. If you want to prove causation, the ideal setup is a randomized, randomized control controlled trial. trial. In a randomized controlled trial, the amount subjects drink isn't influenced by their background or wealth. It's assigned by the researcher, chosen by the flip of a coin. And so you'd be comparing two truly random groups. Can you randomly select people to drink five drinks a day for a long period of time? Right, so you're hitting on some of the, the challenges of creating a randomized control trial for alcohol. There's ethical concerns. You'd be making people drink something that might harm them. Then there are practical concerns to catch the long-term effects of alcohol. You'd really wanna start the trial very early in someone's life and follow them for decades. Despite all these challenges, in 2015, this big group of researchers set out to do the first big randomized controlled trial. It would last six years with one group not drinking at all and the other drinking about one drink a day. The plan was to end up with a sample size of about 8,000 people. 8,000 people for six years? Like, that's a huge effort. Especially for a randomized controlled trial. You know, observational studies regularly have thousands of people in them because they're looking at a whole population. But to actually do an experiment where you're giving one half alcohol, this, mm -hmm. is, this is huge. They were all set to go, 
And then the New York Times sort of blew the lid off the whole thing. The study was partly funded by the alcohol industry, which is not uncommon in this field. But what raised eyebrows is that two of the lead researchers met with industry reps beforehand and strongly suggested that the study's results would endorse moderate drinking as healthy. The study was canceled. Oh. So our chance for a randomized control trial uh, was dashed. Bummer. But we're not out of tools yet. If researchers can't randomly assign drinking habits, maybe genetics could do it. That's the premise behind a relatively new research method called Mendelian randomization. This is the guy with the peas, right? That's the guy with the peas. Czech friar Gregor Mendel worked out the basics of genetics by obsessively studying pea plants. He found that genes are randomly distributed among offspring. And the first step of a Mendelian randomization study is looking for a few genes that are associated with the behavior you're interested in. We could find genes that at a population level are gonna predispose you to, you know, drink more. One of the genes that they use is the flushing gene that you have covered ah, before. The one that I have, it um, codes for an enzyme that metabolizes alcohol. And your version of this gene means less of this enzyme. For that reason, this toxic substance builds up in our bodies and makes us turn fuchsia in my case like so red mm -hmm. it's very uncomfortable i get a terrible headache and so that's why i never picked up drinking but my sister doesn't have it so like you know well there you go it's per perfect example of like flipping a coin these two daughters of the same family one has it one doesn't now globally the drink less version of a gene might be more common in some populations but within a specific subpopulation your chance of carrying that variant should be random not influenced by your social class and certainly not your lifestyle that doesn't mean that people with this drink more variant are destined to become heavy drinkers or even drinkers at all. It just means that averaged across the entire population, people with this version of the gene will tend to drink more. We can think of these as sort of random tickets telling people you're more likely to drink, say, an extra glass a day. That's why we sort of described Mendelian randomization as nature's clinical trial. In 2022, Kieran Bittinger and his colleagues published a Mendelian randomization study of 370,000 people in the UK with European ancestry. And looking at that entire group, they found... On average, if you were to drink more, that's bad. Across a bunch of measures of heart health, people with the drink more gene variants were worse off. And with a bunch more statistical analysis, they could see how outcomes changed at different levels of drinking. More alcohol seems to cause increased risk of cardiovascular disease, no matter where you are on the alcohol spectrum. There's a significant amount of doubt that's been cast around this protective effect. So at the very least, we can question this prior consensus that drinking a little bit is better than drinking nothing. You're recently of drinking age, is that have, right? Yes. Like you're in the midst of this research, but you're also in college. How, how do you think about this? As someone who's recently come of drinking age, I think over the course of a lifetime, cutting back on your alcohol intake is healthy, but having a drink every now and then also isn't going to kill you. There's harms to a, to a lot of stuff that we do. There's tons of things that if you didn't do them, you'd be safer. Like go outside. <laughs> yeah, go outside. Leave your house. Go drive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. People die in car crashes. It doesn't mean that we're going to not drive our cars. So what's the best way to put the risk of drinking in perspective? Well, let's go back to that giant global meta study that looked at a bunch of different diseases that can be caused by alcohol. In high-income countries, the most common one is cancer. In low-income countries, it's tuberculosis because alcohol hurts your immune system. And there are 21 other diseases on the list. Of course, you can get those diseases even if you don't drink. The authors found that out of a population of 100,000 non-drinkers, in a given year, 914 people will come down with one of these diseases. So that's the baseline risk, a little less than 1% chance of getting any of these diseases in one year. But what happens if everyone starts drinking one drink a day? That number rises, but only to 919, just five more people come down with one of these diseases. At two drinks a day, another 60 people get sick every year. That doesn't seem so bad. Doesn't seem so bad. I mean, that's across one year, so obviously the absolute numbers increase over time. Mm. And as you get into heavy drinking, the risk rises faster. Plotting this risk on a graph, you can see that even at two drinks a day, it stays pretty low. It's not a J, but it's not that steep of a line either. So just how dangerous is this? 
Well, there's still a frustrating amount of uncertainty around that question. We need more good data. But there's growing agreement that even a little bit of alcohol can increase your risk of cancer and other diseases. But at moderate doses, it doesn't increase that risk by that much. The World Health Organization's announcement, the Surgeon General's warning, they're all part of a kind of course correction. Decades of headlines left people believing that moderate drinking was practically medicinal, that it was actually really good for your heart, even as lots of new studies called that into question. Public health officials who are really publicizing these study results aren't trying to make everyone stop drinking. People assume I'm Professor No Fun Pants, especially when you're in alcohol research, you just don't get invited to New Year's Eve parties and stuff like that. But these days, I'm what you call an occasional drinker. They just want to make sure everyone knows that there is some risk. And it's important to say that risk is different for every individual. You might have a family history of cancer that raises your baseline risk. Alcoholism could push you up that curve. And there are a bunch of impacts this graph doesn't capture. You might find that alcohol messes up your sleep, your mental health, your decisions, your relationships. On the flip side, you might feel like drinking is an important part of your social life or community. It does seem mm -hmm. like there's possibly a tendency for the public to accept one of two answers good for me, mm -hmm. bad for me. And like these shades right. of gray that you're painting, maybe we're naive about um, how people might register that. It's either can't do it or all clear, you know, for anything. Right, right. It's messy, it's difficult. I'm not sure how to finish this episode <laughs> with in a satisfying way. Yeah, uh, it'll come to you. To your health. If you're interested in how we know what we know, you can join us on Patreon, where we just started hosting a monthly science paper book club. We love talking to our Patreon subscribers, and we really couldn't do this without them. We're also supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in association with IMI, the Independent Media Initiative. The Sloan Foundation is enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern era. 